I want to ask you, first, just quickly tell me push to text. What does it do? I know you talked about it a lot, but... Yeah, push to test is a uh, is is <laughs> it was started by a friend of mine. His name's Frank Cohen, and he started uh, an open source project out of Sun about ten years ago. And that open source project uh, was to uh, uh, give a platform to developers where they could preload the apps that they were building. So. You know, it's one thing to put 20 people on something and test it, but how about if there's going to be 20,000 mm -hmm. or a million? I mean, how do you test that? So he developed a platform to enable that kind of performance testing and over 10 years had uh, 3 million downloads of the thing and somewhere between 500,000 and a million active users. And um, from that, uh, you know, he, he showed up at my door in the summer and said, uh, I've got this thing and it's got 3 million downloads and it's one of the most successful open source platforms ever in any field, and um, I don't know how to monetize it. <laughs> Big problem. Yeah. And? and what what uh, year was that, or when was that? <clears throat> that was just back in June, and, and so I said, all right, well, first of all, I said, you're crazy, I'm open source. Right. Open, you know. But <clears throat> the more you looked into it, you said, wow, you know, with the advent of the growth in mobile, the advent of the growth in apps, including client-side apps, and very sophisticated apps, mm -hmm. remember Ajax and JavaScript, et cetera. You're getting to a point now where people are pushing out apps in, in what's called an agile development environment. So they're pushing them out very, very rapidly. They really need to have a quick way to test them. And not only the developers need to have that, IT, who's ultimately going to own that app, needs to have it. And frankly, brand management needs to have it because your brand is now so affiliated with what you're doing in your online apps or your mobile apps that you can't possibly have these things fail in any way, shape, or form, or in fact just slow down or, or lock up or the things that they do, or deliver bad data or wrong data. So all of a sudden this platform where it went from this nice open source thing for test developers, we you know, sort of schemed on a way to take that, take it to the cloud, and uh, create a user interface that you don't have to be a test developer and a test coder to use. So now it empowers brand management mm -hmm. to figure out themselves what they're running into when they put a million users on that app. And uh, it empowers uh, uh, people in the IT group to say, hey, listen, before I take that stuff that, that, right. that, that, the, that the software developers say is good, I'm going to find out if it's good. Yeah. And what's it going to do to my systems when I've got a million people or half a million people or 10 million people or whatever it is on there? And that's what we do. We've already got uh, a large number of Fortune 1000 uh, customers who've hopped on board to try our, you know, earlier what we call enterprise uh, stuff, and uh, we'll launch this more to the sort of general developer de developer community at very low cost basis, just pay as you use, uh, in about three or four months. It's very exciting. We're empowering people to figure out what happens in your app. And, yeah. And I will tell you though, and we'll end here. Uh, this part is is <clears throat> it's been amazing to me. You know, when I ran software teams, I've run them in the past, and you say, well, what happens when you get thousands of users on? You say, well, we'll add more servers. And now with the advent of load balancers and a lot of server technology to do that, you think the load problem went away. You just add more servers. Well, it turns out with the advent of these very sophisticated apps, both on the client side and the server side, and that they tendril out like a spider web to hundreds of other services that they have to grab data from and interact with Facebook and Twitter and weather and all kinds of things. Um, the, the problems are no longer can I scale my servers. You can put as many servers nice. as you want. Most of the user experience problems we see in these apps, and these include major customers, um, Pepsi and Deutsche Bank and, and Best Buy and things like this, um, they occur way before you have a server load problem. You know, you're nice. at... 20% of server load and the user experience has begun to degrade in some horrible way or lock up or freeze and you got okay what's wrong with this what was written in the code that causes this to work when there's one user but causes it to to start to impact the user's experience and this whole idea of raising the bar to this is all about the user experience mm -hmm. it's not like you know the old uh, what we call HP load runner tests of you know 5 10 years ago they would just bang stuff at a server and watch the server crash I don't care what the server's doing. I want to know what the user's seeing. If I'm the brand manager and I'm at Pepsi, I'm not worried just about the user ranking my app with one star. I'm worried he's going to drink Coke. Right. I really am. Because yeah. if they're under 35, this is such a represent. It's as much a representation of your brand. You know, if you're Procter & Gamble, this is as much a representation of your brand, this contest you're running online, as is the actual products you make. Yeah. Especially to a younger generation. So this is a way to protect your brand. It's amazing. Okay, well, I have like five questions, but I'm going to narrow it down to two. First of all, is it only mobile apps? Mm -mm. No. 
all social mobile apps, okay. everything from e-commerce sites to regular websites all the way to the mobile side. So the, the grand spectrum of apps. Okay, because one of the questions I have on the mobile side, is it a, a shorter test time because you're dealing with the different... No. You know, uh, in fact, you know, most apps, most is, uh, may not be an exaggeration actually, most apps today are written uh, around HTML5. So right. you really want to write an app that works in the mobile environment and it may not be necessarily native in the mobile environment, I was but, ask, but, right. but you know it's working even if it looks native. It's really an HTML5 app, and it works in the in the desktop and and and, and laptop environment. Remember today, traffic is sort of half and half. You know, okay. depending on whose numbers you're looking at, and mobile will cross over that that uh, traffic uh, number um, in the next year or two, or very very soon. So if you're developing apps you have to develop equally for desktop, laptop environments as well as for mobile environments and iPad, which is almost somewhere in between. Right. And the ideal thing is you can do this in HTML5 and, and do it in a way that senses where you are and what browser you're on and reconfigures itself a little bit for that browser. But the basic code behind it is generally the same. Um, that's the fastest development methodology. Okay. Uh, but native makes it much... Well, More native powerful? is just harder because it, it not necessarily, but it, you know, when you do native apps, they look really, really good, <clears throat> but they're real development efforts because yeah. now you have to develop your HTML app for the HTML5 world, right. and you have to develop a native iOS app, and you have to develop a native Android app, and you have to develop potentially a Windows app, you know, for Windows phones, and maybe if BlackBerry sort of comes back around and gets its act together with all due respect we used to love blackberry but now you get a you know now you got five apps you're writing and you go you know where do i stop here so i think you see a lot of these larger uh development uh uh efforts say look we're going to be html5 to the extent we can across all platforms because at least that's cross-platform uh, otherwise, you can pull your pull your teeth out. But obviously, there's a lot of native app development going right. on as well. Right, and that's it's going to continue to evolve. Of course. The second question I was thinking: What's the most surprising thing you have found from the client side? I know it hasn't been very long, but in terms of is it more brand managers who are after hmm. this? Is it a certain industry sector? Well, <clears throat> so you know when you look at three million downloads and you break that apart and you say how many active users are there's maybe six eight hundred thousand some number like that on the push to test platform. <clears throat> this pay for platform, the first thing you do is step back and say, how do we monetize this? Well, look, there's only so many customers, a few thousand, that can pay, call it $100,000 plus a year for enterprise class service. That's really white glove service where they expect the services and they expect to be handheld and they expect that there's a third party involved really looking at what they're doing because they cannot risk their brand. But between those few thousand and the other 600,000 um, you know, that had gotten stuff for free, there's most of those 500 and something thousand of them, they can pay something, but not $100,000. And so to, to, I'm going to say dumb it down, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but you, you know, to take something that has thousands of features and get it to where it only has the core few that, that you don't really have to be well, well versed in, in, in test development so that you can, uh, for a low cost way, go after all the rest of these developers. Right. The biggest market is those other you know million developers, half a million developers that can afford a couple thousand dollars a year to do all of their testing. Yeah. And these are development houses, small groups, people in garages, startups, whatever. <clears throat> and that's probably a much bigger market than Fortune 1000, yeah. although we clearly want to. Just... So in the Fortune 1000, you get brand and management involved, you get IT involved, you get, you get development involved, you get test dev. But, you know, of course, at these smaller uh, uh, organizations, they don't have brand management, but they're worried that, you know, something's going to go wrong and they're flying blind and they don't like to fly blind. So, um, you know, we give them a, a way to not be so blind about what's going to happen when they launch their app. So it's like a packaging version, depending on who that is. Cloud-based, like. low cost. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we have something that we're doing here um, today at AOTV, which is we've asked for questions and predictions from our online audience as well. Mm -hmm. And there is a question that has oh, come in that okay. I want to I want to pose to you okay. because it's about you. And um, the oh, question was, I want to find out from Kevin what were his best and worst moments in his career. Um, <clears throat> and maybe you could start by just giving us some highlights because you've had a very continue to have a very interesting and and varied career. Well, the best moments. Um, well, when I was <clears throat> strictly doing clean tech, and, and um, as, as people can figure out my background, you know, I've, 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 I've run some of the larger clean tech companies. I'm still on three clean tech boards. I, I've done software companies before that. I'm doing software companies now and some, and some med tech companies. <clears throat> but 
you know, when clean tech was uh, important to the country, important to the world, important to the planet, not saying it isn't, but it was in people's minds. When it was ranking number one, two, or three in terms of energy, energy security, and all these things in, in everybody's mind in this country. And when it was there uh, in the administration's uh, mind as well. Um, we, uh, as, as at, at Cirrus Energy at the time, Cirrus Materials, um, got so much attention from, um, you know, everyone across the board, from senators to governors to presidents and vice presidents, that, uh, you know, you'd, ne you'd never say, oh, that was the best career, that was the best. Right. But look, it's clearly a tremendous honor to be standing with the President of the United States or the Vice President of the United States. They have a Vice President come out and help you open a plant and launch a plant. You know, we had six plants at, at Sirius at the time. This is a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, being asked to speak to Congress, uh, you know, and just keynote a one-hour session, and they didn't care what you talked about. They just said, you don't even have to tell us. It's all your, the stage is yours. Here you go. I, you know, that's, it's a beyond a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It never happens again, right? So, look, I'm humbled by those opportunities. Um, you know, we were building a real business um, and, and did some 70,000 projects retrofitting buildings with very high technology uh, uh, that would save energy in the buildings. We did the Empire State Building, which is an unbelievable honor to do. Wow. This iconic structure, the New York Stock Exchange, and you know thousands and thousands and thousands of others. So to have that kind of impact, saving truly billions of pounds of, of, of CO2 was, was uh, unbelievably um, touching and heartwarming and humbling. Amazing. To, uh, to me. Yeah. And I, I mean, I picked up on you saying, when green was. Mm. Can we, can we just say, is the worst moment when you realized it is no longer, or where, where do you think we stand? Yeah, so I mean, it, it, I mean, you know, things come and go, and it, you know, the, the challenge with clean tech has been all clean tech companies, so, you know, whether it's solar or wind or biofuels or uh, efficiency, virtually all of them um, need, you need to build things. And when you need to build things, it takes a lot of money. And so uh, you had an awful lot of clean tech companies that raised over a billion dollars in private equity from venture and failed to deliver a product after a billion dollars. Uh, that's not the kind of losses that the venture industry can handle. <clears throat> you know, venture really uh, cut its teeth on companies that it put 20, 30, 40 million into, and you could take them public in a few years for a couple hundred million. Now those days are gone. You know, these days you, you're taking companies public more like a billion dollar market cap <clears throat> and you might have to put 100 million or more, but but billion dollar losses. And so when Solyndra failed about a year ago, as we speak now, uh, that really really uh, hurt the overall clean tech environment. And people stepped back and said, you know, there's been almost no exits in this space. There's been a handful of exits, and after they exited, all the stocks fell. Uh, most of them fell by 90 percent, and the companies went bankrupt. This is just not a space that venture can can afford to be in. So once venture dried up, you know what? If you want to change the energy picture on this planet, you need governments involved. Mm -hmm. Writing now, you know, I know with all due respect, we can't afford it in this country. But, but uh, um, you know, you sort of need governments to say, look, I'm going to set aside, make up enough fifty billion. We're going to lose a lot of that, but we've got to invest in this because we've got to we've got to move us off oil or move. Uh, so you had a couple of things. You had Cylinder go under. You had no major exits, very, very few exits. Tesla exited, did very well. A couple of other things, uh, and then everything else fell off the, 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 the plate. Um, and, and you had natural gas go from $12 per million BTU to about $2 per million BTU right. because of fracking. The combination of those things makes clean tech a very challenging industry for the moment. It's not impossible. There's certain situations where it works. I mean, clearly... At Sirius, we did 70,000 projects. They did save energy. I mean, you know, the Empire State right. Building has been very, very well documented and very well instrumented to show the amount of energy they saved from these very high R value windows that we designed and, and uh, 6,542 windows in that building. Oh, my God. Uh, so so 26,000 panes of glass on a factory we built on the fifth floor. So... <laughs> So um, there's a story there. There's a lot of story. So anyway, that long, long-winded thing. But yes, I, I think, I think, uh, frankly, funding in clean tech is absolutely dead. The, the companies that I'm on the board of, you know, we've got to do inside rounds. I mean, the, yeah. the, you know, there's just no more funding in the space, and the ones I'm on the board of are doing very well with large order bases, and still there's no money. It's like, look, we're running a social and mobile and big data and other things. Now, all that said, you can't blame the venture community for doing so. Their job is not. <clears throat> to clean up the environment, to fix our energy puzzle, or to do the government's work. Right. Or to save humanity. Their job is to give the best return they can to their limiteds. 
And where do they stand on the technology <clears throat> side? Uh, of clean tech? No, just oh, now moving on. Oh, right on now? To, yeah. oh, well, okay, so, you know, <laughs> so because of the FDA, basically, you know, med tech is basically done biotech. I mean, there, there's very little funding in that space. There's, I think there's some great opportunities if you can avoid the FDA. <clears throat> but if you walk into any VC, including the VCs who have traditionally funded uh, things in the medical space and say, hey, and once we get through our FDA, they say, look, just leave, mm -hmm. leave. If, in fact, either you leave or I'm running screaming because you said F, D, and A in the same sentence. <clears throat> if, it's similar right now. If you say the words clean and tech right. in the same sentence, you're persona non grata. How so, about mobile, cloud? Oh, you say mobile, cloud, big data. Oh, my goodness. All you right. know, everything's <laughs> happening. But again, <clears throat> we suspect there's good returns there. You know, the amount of money these companies takes, uh, take is a lot smaller to figure out if yeah. you've got to play. You typically know, even putting in five or 10 million, I've got something with legs. And then you might fund it to another 20 or 30 or 40, and then you can get it out or get it bought for hundreds of millions, number one. Number two, the multiples are very high. You know, the multiples in clean tech have, you know, if you get one, two, three X, that was good. And there were some examples of, you know, eight X. Yeah but not too many above that, where you see these social mobile things, uh, you know, selling sometimes for 20 or 25 X revenue. Well, that's a heck of a return. And if you can do that in two or three years, the IRR on that, the internal rate of return is spectacular for VC. So, you know, it's very easy to sit here and blame, v it, you know, right. VCs are not government, they're not in it for their health. You know, they are in it to give a return to the limited partners that they took money from. And they should go to the places that are, that are going to give them the biggest return, I, you know, with no blame. Yeah. Even though there's people who will flame me now for saying this. Well, we like that. We like to be provocative. But, but you know, that's their job. If we want to raise money for clean tech companies, you're going to have to go to other pockets. Now, by the way, there's there's people in the space. There's some fish stuff that's going on. It's sustainable fishing, etc. They went and did it as a nonprofit and raised a hundred million dollars from a major, you know, funder of nonprofits. That's a great way to do that. It's not a venture thing. Right. This needs to be grown up as a non And then if they turn it into a business and return that money to the nonprofit, that was a bonus. But they don't even look for their money back. They're trying to do this for humanity. So go to people who want to do things for humanity if you want to fund these things. But you can't go to venture. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, that's the lesson yeah. learned. Can I ask you a prediction? In the technology industry. Dep depends on what it is, sure. What, well, I mean, what is a, you know, everyone's coming in here saying, I predict. Can you give mm -hmm. me a sense of where you think there's going to be growth, specifically in software technology sure. in this area? Um, or an insight that you had just while you were in your presentation or a <clears throat> question from the audience? Well, I, you know, I, I can predict the obvious. I can predict that, um, you know, virtually all of our uh, computing and interaction and, and interface and communication is going to happen in the mobile world, either, either you know, tablets or, or phones. <clears throat> you know, we're essentially with these things now carrying a, a cray, what was a cray 25 right. years ago, in our pocket. <clears throat> and so it changes what we can do. It changes the entire concept of, you know, fully interactive communication all the time, 100%, always on, I'm connected to the entire world. And I can, you know, I can, I, I can compute everything I need to do to get from here to the moon and back in just a couple of seconds. The, the, the amount of computational horsepower, the amount of connectivity to servers on the back yeah. end, the amount of you know, communication we have, you know, multiple video streams. You and I can video and I can video with, uh, I, I'll break the fourth wall by saying there's camera people here, <laughs> we can video with them. We, I mean, you know, the whole thing. So it's really, really, really interesting. We've never had that before. So I think we're at the very, very beginnings <clears throat> of exploiting that technology. And you know, we sit here today and go, oh, mobile's gonna be big. However it's going to be big, I'm going to say 20 years from now, we can't possibly predict today. Yeah. Uh, because the apps that we're seeing today, uh, you know, we're, we're, there are almost a lot of them are sort of leftovers from the online, the regular online world, the desktop world, the laptop world, and th things the way we've done them. <clears throat> but, but this is going to disrupt so much. It's already disrupted the whole concept of, you know, internet. And certainly now mobile has disrupted newspapers to right. death. We're disrupting the way books are printed because they don't need to be printed anymore. You just carry it with you and read it on your device. Uh, without question, we will disrupt television. We're disrupting all media and the way it was distributed because television is just a distribution medium for a show that could be syndicated to an iPhone right. and will be and syndicated to a, a you know a, 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 a pad and syndicated other things. So uh, television still has an awful lot of advertising dollars that that you know that are going to go somewhere and uh, they're going to go where the audience is and the eyeballs and the audience are going to mobile devices. Um, in, on a chart just just today, I saw that uh, still newspaper gets its absolute inordinate share 
of overall advertising dollars, given the eyeballs that it has, right. which are now small. It's, it, so it takes a long time for these businesses to ship. And, and part of the reason for that is your CMOs at the largest companies that write the biggest checks, you know, are not 25. Right. They're not using mobile that way. They're going to do their newspaper buys. They're going right. to do their magazine buys. The, generally, the way they have been, and maybe a little less every year, a little more. Every, but but the, but the shift went like this. Right. But they're not going to shift like that. They can't possibly shift that quickly. But over a decade, <clears throat> we will see those dollars shift. So um, I, I, I look. Uh, one of the companies I'm working with is doing some amazing things in terms of mobile sensing of your health. Mm -hmm. So so some things with saliva that we can tell about your health like um, C-reactive protein. Wouldn't it be interesting if in the morning um, you would just take a little bit of a saliva swab and put in this thing and it says you have an extremely high chance of having a heart attack in the next 24 hours, you should see your doctor. <laughs> that, that's not and science that's fiction. that's on a Monday. <laughs> yeah, that's not science fiction. Wow. You know, uh, uh, a lot of uh, people over 50, certainly males, have learned yeah. to take their aspirin every day and, you know, this would take that kind of market penetration, that kind of marketing, but... You know, these are the kinds of things, or glucose sensing in that way, yeah. with just saliva, or or hydration. I mean, people don't realize that when you get dehydrated, all these other things are happening in your body, or your your brain is shrinking, and all kinds of terrible things. And actually, our our thirst sensors are easily thirty to sixty minutes out of sync with when your body actually needs right. hydration. By the and time so, you're thirsty, it's too late. It's, it's way too late.